a Nipsey Hustle. What's the deal? What's up, man? How you feeling? Excellent. What's Excellent. What's Congratulations up? on, you know what I mean? What I feel is you keep elevating the whole time. No question. Every time I see you, you into some some new cool shit. That's what's up, man. The marathon continues. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, let's let's take it back for a second. Like, where exactly did you grow up? Um, I grew up on the west side of LA. So okay. I was in Crenshaw District. Okay. Um, and what's that area called that people live out there? Um, it's called the Crenshaw District. The gang that's that's prominent over there is the Rolling Sixties. Rolling Sixties. You know, it's like, you know, the um, like the West Side of South Central Crenshaw District, okay. High Park area. Got a few names, but in the streets, it's known as the Rolling Sixties. Now, now, is the Rolling Sixties the the biggest number of people? Like you know, in terms of like just sheer numbers, is the Rolling Sixties guy the biggest gang in LA? It's one of the biggest gangs, one of the biggest crib gangs. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it's one of the most dominant and one of the most like historically like respected areas. Okay. Far before we was with the shit, we was, you know what I mean, into it. It was going on, there was a lot of like reputable older dudes that came through and, you know, gave it, gave it hood his fame and gave it hood his name that it's known for his reputation. Our generation, you know what I'm saying, was kind of responsible for like putting it on the map in terms of like hustling and business and you know what I'm saying, like making moves outside of the streets, you know what I'm saying, and taking it to, you know, a corporate level. Not not necessarily taking gang banging, but taking the legacy of our area to, to like, you know, a corporate level. Now, did you really have a choice, you know, Joining, joining the 60s when you when you were young or was it just all your family members was in it so you were in it? Nah, really me, none of my family members was from over the 60s. My dad came from Africa. Oh, so okay. his, his whole side of my family's in Africa. And then my mom, she only had one brother and it was her. So my uncle, uncle was like a hustler and a musician. And uh, my mom, she's a woman. She grew up on Slauson and Fifth Avenue, 60s for her whole life. Mm -hmm. As well as my granny and my, my grandfather, you know, they own property in the hood since like thirties and forties. So why what made you decide to actually get involved in all that? Because you know, I mean, I'm sure you you knew what the downsides were before you got into it somewhat. Yeah. Nah, I think it was it was like a combination of, you know what I'm saying, just being out of age. I left my house kinda early. How old? When I was probably like fourteen. Okay, so you're on your own at fourteen years old. Yeah, out out of my mom's house, you know what I'm okay. saying? I went to live with my granny. Okay. When I was 14, and um, you know, I just was was uh, taking care of myself early on, and um, you know, I was I was doing things to try to get money, so I could support myself. I always wanted to do music. That was my first passion before anything, and out of frustration from not having outlets and having studio access, you know, the culture of my area is the gang culture. You know what I'm saying? So by being outside being involved with hustling, being in the hood, doing things to try and get money, being young, you know, riding your bike through the hood, getting shot at, yo, 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 loved ones and homies that's your age, getting killed, getting shot at, you know, getting jumped at malls and at basketball, football games, high school games, whatever. You know what I mean? Getting into it. It's like, we were just raised like, if you with me, if something go down, I'm, I'm, I'm in it whether I'm from this shit or not, you know what I'm saying? So after a while, it just be like, you always in the middle of some shit, you might as well, you know what I mean? Be part of it. Be part of Official. it. Official. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Or like, don't be part of it and get the fuck out the way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Either one. I mean, like, you hear, I mean, I don't know the, the different sex, but you hear that there's, like, jump in type of things and stuff like that. Did that, that happen to you? Yeah, you gotta get caught on, you gotta fight. Okay, so you gotta jump in. Yeah, you gotta is, fight. Is it like a... A certain amount of time or I mean it's different for everybody, you know what I'm saying? You just gotta it's basically whoever like, you know, um orchestrating your put on basically. Sometimes you, you know what I'm saying, you be young niggas putting you on and you just get ran. You just fight until niggas feel like you're done fighting. Sometimes be a, a somebody that got a little bit more, you know what I'm saying, like love for, for young dudes and a little bit more compassion and you might have a different experience. You know what I mean? Some niggas just got their ass beat and still wasn't from the hood. Sure. And, you know, it's because it was young niggas putting them on and didn't give a fuck about it. I remember riding around in LA and you had announced that you're dropping a hundred dollar mixtape album. Street album. Street album. It was $100. called a mixtape because it wasn't my official debut. Right. 
But it was all original. So I'm, I'm not going to say who was saying it, but I'm on the radio and, and the DJs was clowning me. Yeah. Like $100 for an album. Yeah. Nipsey tripping, ain't no one gonna buy that shit. Come on, man. Like, yeah, come yeah. on, Nipsey, a hundred dollars. Like, yeah, motherfuckers yeah. get that shit for free. Yeah. And look what happened. Yeah. yeah. What happened exactly? Um, I mean, and to sum it all up, you know, we, we sold out on the first day. We, we passed what we expected to do. How many copies? A thousand copies at a hundred dollars each. Okay, that's uh, a thousand and a hundred. That's a hundred thousand. Absolutely. hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, it wasn't even about the money. More, that wasn't the headline. The headline was that we had something going on with our fans that they was willing to pay 10x what they used to paying for other products mm -hmm. and other releases from other artists. They was willing to pay 10 times more for ours. Okay. And I think that's a statement that says something about the level of you know engagement and the level of connection and the level of respect that, you know, the fan base has for, for the message and for what we do. How did you really think of this idea? Like, like how, how did that hundred dollar idea pop in your head? Um, I talk about it a lot. It was a book I read by an author named Jonah Burton. Okay. And um, it was referred to me by, you know, one of my mentors, Big Bob Francis. And one of the chapters was talking about how it was a Philadelphia cheesesteak company called Barclay Cheesesteaks. And they started selling hundred dollar cheesesteaks. And they got similar reactions at first. This dude crazy, public slander. But shortly thereafter, it started to become like a status product. You know what I mean? And then people like Oprah came through and people like David Letterman came through and wanted to talk about what's up with this hundred dollar cheese steak and start getting all type of coverage. And now it's like a staple in the city. Really? It's oh, like, it's still around? Yeah, for sure. Okay. It's still a hundred dollars. <laughs> for sure. That's the, you know, that's like one of the, it's like Roscoe's in LA. You know what I mean? You go to Barclay and you go to Philly, you get a hundred dollar cheese steak. Okay. I, I I heard you know my business partner George Paniche was telling me about like a thousand dollar Sunday ice cream Sunday mm -hmm. out here in New York with gold flakes in. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's something like that. It's just about number one. I know like the type of business we do with our merch, and I know what those orders look like. It'd be five hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, three hundred dollars. So then it's all you know people that or connected via the music. That's why they come to the merch nine times out of 10. Mm -hmm. And so it was never a doubt that my, 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 my circle or my, you know, my people that's riding with me would spend a hundred dollars on a product alone. It sure. was just about justifying it to them and making sure that the value that they got was worth more than a hundred. You know, that's why we made it a concert experience. Mm -hmm. um, we signed it handwritten, made it, you know, number each one through a thousand gave cool things away to like the first people that bought into the idea. And um, it was just it was just historical. I think people like to be a part of history. People like to be a part of things the first time that they happen. Uh, uh, Jay-Z bought into it. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, did, did, he, did he just go and just order a hundred copies or did he hit you up or something like that? Like, was there a story behind it or did he just order the copies? Nah, not a long story. You know, he, he sent word via his team, Rock Nation team, that um, he wanted to support. And um, he said also, you know, through Elliot Wilson and beat up. He was just like, I salute the move, you know? Good, you know, great thinking on the idea. And that was really the extent of the communication. Okay. But, you know, the demonstrations speak loud. He spent 10,000 with us. You know what I'm saying? We ain't signed the Rock Nation. It ain't no investment or stake he got in our success. So it was, to me, it was just genuine, it was sincere. It wasn't a publicity stunt to help his artists out because I'm not his artist. Right. You know, so I just looked at it as just a sincere move. Him being a dude that started out the trunk himself, was considered an underdog a good majority of his career, and just, you know, shattered everybody's preconceived notions about not only his success and his level he could take it to, but rappers in general. I think he kind of like resonated with the, with the story of us taking shit into our own hands and just doing it our way. I don't know, I can't speak for his intentions, but that's what I was assuming. So you never even spoke to him afterwards? Nah, we wrote a letter to Jay on behalf of the company just to thank him. Okay. And then uh, one of his friends, Emery, Emery Jones, reached out, you know, through Rock Nation and was like, they wanted to purchase some clothes. And we just felt like they already spent enough, we wanted to just ship them something. Right. And so we, we shot some clothes back to Rock Nation and then Emery shot us a picture back wearing a Crenshaw sweater. Okay. And that was dope to me because, you know, through Jay Rhymes, 
we, we kind of know him. We know that he stood up, he did his time. He a respectable dude out here. So like, you know, that's what I'm into. People like that supporting the brand, I, you know, I respect that too, you know, that's what I, that's what I really make it for, you know what I'm saying? That's for, for people that, not necessarily just street people, but people that stand up people and respectable people. So it was dope to see an embrace by him. Now, now you, I mean, originally when I heard about Nipsey, you were on a label. Yeah. You were on, which label again? Epic and Cinematic. Cinematic, Cinematic was a label that yeah. had a partnership with Epic with Records. Epic, yeah, exactly. And John Shapiro. John Shapiro, right. Jim McDaniels, Big U, Steve Lopez. Right, exactly. Yeah. But at one point, you decided to leave late and just go completely independent. Yeah. But what was really the, the reason behind that? Because, I mean, Epic is, I mean, these days, a pretty good label. You nah. Know, most, future on there, like, doing definitely. this thing. Like, yeah, most definitely. You know, Yo Gotti's album is dope. I just yeah, heard it. Like, yeah. they, well, L.A. Reid, was he over there at the time? Nah, he wasn't. Actually, Charlie Walker signed me. Charlie okay. Walker's at RCA, I think, now. Okay. You know, but um, Charlie Walker, good dude. Um, You know, um. Adam Granite was the general manager over there. But in between us working on the album, it was a whole regime change. Uh, new people came into the building. Not LA Reed, before LA Reed. Okay. And um, you know, it just was a, a difference of, you know, visions. We had different visions in terms of what they wanted to do with their company, what I wanted to do with my brand. And it shouldn't be like, it shouldn't be a tug of war. It should be like a momentum is built set a date, drop the album, re-up, do it again. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so when it didn't happen, I wasn't upset or nothing. I was just like, you know, let me let me figure it out myself. You know, let's not argue, let's not go back and forth about what we can do. Let me just figure it out myself, you know what I mean? And that was cool about it, like, absolutely. They got me released. Um but, uh, you said that record labels, major record labels are slowly dying. Yeah, I believe so. The business model, the old, the traditional business model with a major label, it's becoming obsolete. And it's be, it, it'll be a victim of the digital revolution if they don't, you know, call it out of it soon. You know what I'm saying? I believe that. I mean, you, you, you now, you're now seeing artists have number one albums out with no record labels. Mac Miller's done it. Yeah. Mac, and Mac Miller did it with no radio play. Yeah. The Mac Miller went and did it with a ton of radio play. And Absolutely. It really murdered it. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, I mean, is that sort of the, the path that you're trying to take it to? Um, most definitely. Like, I, when I first reached out to Mac Miller, I, I was walking through the airport. I seen him on the cover of Billboard. Yeah. And I'm like, this is indie. This is crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just wanted to salute. So I reached out, and then he came by the studio, and we was just talking. He was like, yeah, we, we pre-ordered 120,000 units pre-order. You know what I'm saying? For, for, the, for the first week. I'm like, he like, we did 100 at first, but we had to double up and do another 20 just because it wasn't, you know, supply and demand for them. And that's an indie situation. No radio plays, just organic. No single, no like single. Nah, it's a dope album. You know, yeah. something real that his fans bought into and believed in. And I was like, that's dope. You know what I'm saying? I just want to pick his brain and have a combo with him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with Benji, that own roster. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Me and Wiz cool. So, you know, I just thought it was dope what they were doing indie. You know what I'm saying? And, um, Macklemore, I never got a chance to speak to, but his success obviously was like groundbreaking. Yeah. His last year, that was like the story of the industry. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? So most definitely I drew from both of them situations. I already, you know, grew up watching Master P, watching Birdman, watching Jay-Z, and I was inspired by them business moves and boss moves also. So I always wanted to pattern myself in that direction. Sure. Yeah. Now, now this, the street album, that's not your real album. Nah, it's Would not you consider my, it your real album? It's not my official debut. It's my 2013 contribution, you know what I'm saying? It's, okay. it's, it's the contribution for this year. But the debut album will be Victory Lap in 2014. That'll okay. be in retail, that'll be at iTunes, that'll be officially delivered as my debut album. That's coming out on your label? All money in, no money out. I'm a co-owner in that label, yeah. Co-owner of what? I'm a co-owner in okay. the label, All Money In. I own the four other co-owner? Fats, my brother Black Sam, and Adam. Okay. Yeah. Um, who are some of the people that are kind of locked in on this album already? Producers, appearances, et cetera. Well, on the production side, you know, just the home team. Everybody I always work with, Futuristics, 1500, Rollo Styles, Wizzo. Um, new dude I started working with, this dude named Beto from uh, Port Arthur, Texas. Mm -hmm. He been in the game forever, been in the game of Pimp C, R&B stuff, down south shit, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, 
And then outside of that, like I, I, I'm talking to DJ Khalil, you know, I got with um, with Don Cannon recently. Okay. Um, man, a couple people, but majority of the album that's produced so far is like the home team. You know, Rollo okay. got three on there, Futuristic got like three, 1500 and nothing, got a couple of them on there. So it's just, you know, keeping the sound consistent. What about Guest Versus? Everything solo, so far. The whole album. The whole album is solo. Yeah, so far. Cause you know, you're on Drake's album. Well, we did a record together. I wasn't on the album, but we did a record together in 09 called Killer. And that was, it, that, it was on, that was on a mixtape. It was like a record we did and, you know, originally it was made for his album. And once we done, we finished it, he like, what you wanna do with it? I'm like, shit, it's on you. He like, what you think about leaking it? I'm like, let's go, leak that motherfucker. So we just gave it to the blogs, he put it on OBO.com and you know what I'm saying? Uh, people ran with it. People put it all over unauthorized mixtapes. The radio was playing it out here. That never showed up on his actual. Nah, killer. It wasn't on So Far Gone. Nah, nope, nope. It was after So Far Gone, right before um, Thank Me Later. You know how the So Far Gone, So Far Gone got made it out. Yeah. yeah, nah, it wasn't on that. Wasn't on that. Okay. Nah, you wouldn't know. <laughs> nah, for sure. You know, I thought it was a dope record too. A lot of people like you know still speak about that record. It's a very but, dope record. You know. It wasn't enough of a solo record for me to put it on my album. He did the hook, it was more like him featuring me. So I was like, it's your record, you know, you can do what you want with it. And so we gave it to the, to the blogs and he you know, that was that. I, mean, I performed it in LA though, we, when, he, when he came to LA and um, performed at the Nokia Center. You know, we came out and did Killer, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I got a little spin, but it never ended up on the album. I mean, I've, I've seen y'all kind of together a few times. You talk about that performances. I mean, do uh, you maintain a relationship with Drake? I mean, you know, we don't talk on the phone or like, you know, text or none of that, but I'm sure like, you know, everybody kind of like keep track of what everybody doing. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm a fan first, you know what I mean? I, I, I like the music most definitely. I think he, he one of the dopest of our generation. And I respect Drake him. Drake is, you feel Drake's one of the dopest of our generation? Yeah, no no question. I agree. Yeah, no You problem. know, a lot of people, I feel like, like don't give him his props. Man, that's hate, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't need to keep it 100 or you're not, man. You got to respect right. what's real. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm I'm, I'm a hip-hop head at yeah. heart. I grew up in rap music. So I understand what people doing that at, at an extremely high level. And regardless of, like, what people gripes are or whatever, you got to respect the level dude doing that. You know what I'm saying? So, I, you know, salute to them. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm surprised that that you didn't hit him up for a verse on the new album. I mean, you know, verse for a verse, like you know, like you, you hooked him up on. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, you know, I me, mean, I just I'm a, I'm a nigga that I get it off the ground. You know what I'm saying? So I just ran into Oliver and, and Barney's the other day, and uh, I did a record with this dude named Party Next Door. He um he signed the OVO. He a dope okay. R&B singer. Party Next Door. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he dope as fuck. Yeah, his <laughs> name's like crazy. And so um, I was in Vegas with one of my homegirls. We listened to that shit back to back to back to back. I got to reach out to this nigga, man. Let's do a song. And so we did a record called Candy, and we leaked it. And um, you know, like, I always be like weary of motherfuckers that when I'm like fresh off of success, man, I need this, I need that, I need this. So I ain't never been that nigga. You know what I'm saying? So like, as far as like asking niggas for verses, I asked one time. And if it don't get done, I never take it personal. I know niggas grinding like I'm grinding. Keep it moving. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Um, are you writing a book right now? Yeah, actually, we um, it's it's written. We just designed the layout. It's called the Marathon Book, and it's gonna be um, it's gonna come out in conjunction with Victory Lap. Victory Lap, the third installment of the Marathon. So it's gonna be a book that go with it. You know, around the same time, it's a collab project between myself and George Peniche. We did all my design, all my covers, all my photography. He designed the Marathon logo, the TMC logo. He did, you know, photo shoots and album covers for like DJ Quick, Schoolboy Q. Basically, like dopest design and photographer up and coming right now. You know what I'm saying? So he, he on the team. That's one of my business partners I work with. So we doing, we doing this book together. What's the what's the premise of it? Um, it's like it's like three different textures. One of it is all the photography that. He, he was he covered since I left Epic. When I, when I got the first studio after I left Epic, after we didn't have a budget no more, we had to go buy our own studio, put it together. You know what I'm saying? It was roaches on the floor. You know what I'm saying? It was like one of them situations. It was, you know, we was, we was off shoestring budgets. You know what I'm saying? He covered that whole process of us upgrading the studio and 
getting off probation and, you know what I'm saying, buying my first drop top bins and buying my, you know, selling out the Nokia for the first time, selling out the House of Blues in LA for the first time. Like I said, getting off probation. Um, my daughter early years, you know what I'm saying, her birthdays and we like, he covered the whole process of where Epic stopped in 2009 we picked up together as all money in and been pushing. So that, that's a story, like a visual story. He covered the whole process. Um, the other texture is like articles that I wrote on different subjects, like risk, like love, like loss, like, you know what I'm saying? Things that humans go through and my take on it. Faith, you know what I'm saying? Creativity is my take on things. And the other texture is my handwritten lyrics, some of which ended up on songs that was released. Other lyrics has never been released, but that's just like, old notebooks from seventh grade, images I was sketching, lyrics I drew, and all together is the marathon book. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how, how important being in the, in the position that you, you're in, like I'm hearing merchandising, I'm seeing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of creative ways to sell your album. Yeah. Uh, I'm hearing books. Um, you, you know, is it really, I mean, it almost sounds like you got your own label, your own company, your own everything. I mean, are you essentially completely self-sufficient these days where you don't really need any sort of outside investment? Um, My goal is to be like hip hop's first completely vertically integrated brand. And like, you know, you look at companies like American Apparel, you look at companies like even Carnegie Steel, Ford originally, you look at companies like Apple, you look at companies like, um, 7-Eleven, you walk into 7-Eleven, they got their own real estate. Mm -hmm. And you walk in, they got their own pack of cookies. They got their own Slurpees. They got their own, you know, water bottles. Mm -hmm. So from raw material to retail, they're completely self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like the history of commerce and business in the United States, the, the companies that like destroy industry, like Carnegie Steel, like Ford, like Apple, you know, them companies was all vertically integrated raw material to retail. Apple got Apple stores. Apple got, you know, the Apple campus where they train their, their employees and they, you know, manufacture their chips and they, you know, do their marketing in-house and they do their design in-house. And they got a retail experience when you walk into the store that's unique to the company and it goes in the same direction what the brand represents. And so that's my goal for All Money In to be like hip hop's first vertically integrated brand completely, you sure. know? Now, now you, you came out at a time when things were kind of slow on the West Coast. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you kind of had, obviously, the, the the older generation. You know, I mean, Dre was, was still a very prominent name. Yeah, the Ice yeah. Cubes and all this stuff. But then you kind of, you know, Game was almost like the only dude that was still Representing, new representing the new generation, and was actually getting radio play, and you know was getting like national, international success, looks, yeah. you know, and you kind of came out right around that time. Yeah, I mean, how, how does it feel now when LA is kind of popping again? Yeah, you know, yeah. how does it feel to be in that right now? Oh, um, it feel good. I'm I'm proud of my city. You know what I'm saying? I'm proud of the radio stations for supporting the artists. I'm proud of the artists for working hard and staying in the game when we didn't have no outlets. I'm proud of the city for buying tickets to the concerts, you know, promoting to their friends, traveling around the world with the mixtapes, putting people on. I'm proud of the venues for booking us and giving us chances. LA is very segregated and LA has a bad reputation because of the gang culture. Mm -hmm. But our generation clearly on something else. When me and YG collab and I go to Compton and his hood and put all my jewelry on and I get love. Mm -hmm. He come to the hood and get love shoot videos with his homies in the hood and get love. I mean I mean schoolboy Q, I interviewed him recently and I, I don't I don't wanna misquote him, but it was something to the effect of like like the gang shit, how it was before, ain't really how it is now. People really more focused on the getting money as opposed to all the gang banging these days. Yeah. Was that do you see that? Yeah, I think what happened was that you know, everybody went to jail, man. They changed the laws. They, they gave, they, they created something called a gang enhancement. Mm -hmm. They created something called a gang injunction, where it's a crime to be a gang member. Mm -hmm. It's a crime if you're a gang member to have a cell phone. 
it's a crime if you're gang. It's the way we tap a cell phone? Yeah, to have a white t-shirt on, it's a crime. So if you got a white t-shirt on and you're a gang member, they will take you to jail. Okay. It's called a gang injunction. And a lot of a lot of prominent gangs in LA was placed on gang injunction. You know what I'm saying? So our area was one of them. So, you know, they had my homies on the front page of the LA Times, like like Al Capone. When they when they started the gang injunction, it was like 16 of the homies on the cover of LA Times and shit, you know what I'm saying? That um, you know, hey, wake this nigga up, man. We trying to do an interview, cuz. Wake your ass up, nigga. You know what I'm saying? Nah, but basically they had a lot of the homies cover the LA Times. And then they changed the laws also to where let's say your crime that you commit holds two, three years. If you a gang member and you commit that crime, they have a gang enhancement that they add to the crime, which is five, 10, or 15. So let's say you got an aggravated assault. Your, your, your low term is 18 months, your high term is four years. Let's say you get convicted, you get the four years plus the five year, 10 year, or 15 year gang enhancement. So niggas started to see like, man, if we gonna go do 15 years, it's gonna be for running in the house to get some money, running in the bank to get a few dollars. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be for hanging out four deep in the colors or walking around the hood with a gun on me, or you know, being on hood patrol or just being on average elementary level gang bang. So people started looking at new ways to to survive. Yeah, or just weighing the risk like this doesn't make sense. Right. I might as well devote my renegade energy toward getting money because we ended up in the same places for the same amount of time as if we was like doing major robberies, doing major licks. You sure. get less time for a bank robbery than you get for like being a gang member. Have you, have you done stuff with TDE? With Top Dog? Yeah. Yeah, we toured together in 2009 with Gang. Oh really? The whole LAX tour together with J-Rock, Kendrick, uh -huh. Absol, Ali, um, Top, you know what I'm saying? We toured the whole country. So, so, it was, so it was TD, Nipsey Hussle, and Gang. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was at the time, um, myself, the Slauson Boys, um, J-Rock, TDE, Gang, Black Wall Street. You know what I'm saying? And um, travel the whole country together. You know what I mean? J-Rock, you know, we done a lot of records together. You know uh -huh. Yeah, we done uh, three or four records together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's um, the homie right there. Yeah, I fuck with J-Rock, man. Yeah. He's a real nigga. He was part of that same kind of generation, that same class. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That you came in. Absolutely. you came in with. Yeah. Oh. Uh, how how surprised are you as to, to the level that TV really blew up these days, especially Kendrick? I'm not surprised. So so you saw it back then? Yeah. I mean, I saw some a group of people that wasn't gonna stop. And I, I, I know that's the that's the formula for success. I saw a group of people that came from somewhere that you don't really get the type of opportunities that they was looking at. Same way I look at it. We don't get these opportunities. I'm gonna make this work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I know that feeling of like, you know, how, how dare you fumble? How dare you fail? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you know, I, I remember I talked to, to Schoolboy Q and he was telling me about how I asked what, 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 the, what the success was built on over there. And he said, the first, the first thing he said was, really, it's family. He said that he had slept on, on Top's couch for like two years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like his kids, you know, he'd be on his couch, his kids would be in the morning, like, you know, yeah. getting cereal. Yeah. And he was literally, that was that. You know I mean? People don't like to talk about that, but that level of unity and, yeah. and grind and, and everything else like that is what ultimately gets to, gets to where it is. I believe that, you know, loyalty means a lot. People see that when you're on stage, like them as friends having fun. Right. In the interviews and the photo shoots, them as, like you said, people that slept on each other's couches. And there's people that grinded and been through the trenches together. It was freestyling, you know what I mean? For free, rapping just off the love of the art together. So you could you could you could tell that when you see it, you know what I'm saying? It's organic and the, the industry bullshit usually doesn't get in the way of success when, when, when it's like that, when it's family oriented. You know what I'm saying? It don't, it don't cause the natural fallouts that happen in people to be successful. You know, I mean, I, I live in LA now. Yeah. And, and it's, you're trying the radio, it's Kendrick, 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 Kendrick. Yeah. A couple of years ago, it was none of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you really feel that new LA radio 
really supports their own to the level that they should. Now they do. Like I said, because you know, they have to, or because nah, not even because they have to. They don't have to. They gonna still sell their ad space and get their money regardless. But I think they got people in the buildings like you know Charisma, DJ Charisma, the Young California Movement, right? The LA Leakers, you know what I'm saying? J Crew, Just Incredible, DJ Sour Milk, Big Boy, uh, Fuzzy, you know what I'm saying? That you know Felly that support what's going on in the streets, E Man. You know what I mean? They they know what's up now. Like if you got to pop a mixtape, you really impacting the city. Like Charisma went and got T Fly and put that record on the radio first. L.A. Reid just signed T Fly. Right. Yeah, you know I what I'm saying? About, I heard about that. And, and she had a lot to do with bridging what was going on in the streets and connecting it to radio. I mean, how much support have you gotten from L.A. Radio? I mean, you know, as much as they could possibly give me. You know what I'm saying? Because. I don't really cater my records to like format. I cater to people. So I, my thing is more about my message and, and what I'm what I'm what I'm selling. But every time I give them a record, they play it. My records been really? in, in rotation at Power, mix show rotation. You know, um they chose check me out off off Crenshaw. They debuted that. Sour Milk was in the studio like Nip, give me that record and the rest. He took that in there and told Power to play that. And Power played it and they put it in rotation, you know what I'm saying? And so there's no radio promo budget. It's just organic them being in the studio with us. So I remember being a DJ that went to Japan with me and toured with me and spun with me in Japan. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Woke up and ate breakfast in the hotels with you, you know what I mean? Talked about life and cracked jokes on each other and shit, you know? So they support it as much as they can, you know? Well, you know, I mean, me, me and my man Stretch, have this conversation all the time. You know Stretch? Yeah, I know other man. I don't, yeah, I don't know. He, he manages Sage of Gemini, yeah. I'm Sue, Creation, yeah. League of Stars. Like, that's, that's a real close friend of mine. And uh, a lot of his thing was like, well, look, like, the only real reason to, to fuck with a major label is they're going to put up that 300000 to, to do a nationwide radio promotion. Yeah. Because, you know, you cool. Other than that, unless unless you want to gamble your own three hundred thousand, yeah, 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 which a lot of people don't don't want to do. Yeah, you know that's really what it is. I agree. You know, I just think that it's ways to get that money without giving up ownership. Three hundred thousand ain't no life changing money in the scheme of things. Right. You can't buy a house in LA for three hundred thousand. You gonna be in the hood. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. You gonna hear a helicopter every night. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, it's gonna be real. Yeah, three hundred thousand. So, <clears throat> like. It's about being what type of hustler you are. You know what I'm saying? How you put it all together. You know what I'm saying? If you want to be an owner, but you want your records at radio, you got to find out how to do that. You know what I mean? If it's put up your own money, if it's figure out where else to get the money from, you got to figure out how to do that. Or you got to go ahead and just take a, a situation that makes sense to you. Me personally, you know, I'm selling mine to people. I'm selling my product to people. I ain't selling it to the format. I ain't selling it to the platform. I'm selling mine to people. That's what my shit is fucked the middle man. Well, you know what I mean? I, I sat down with Yo Gotti the other night. Yeah. Right? And he said that after his, you know, he had like buy himself out of two record deals. I heard about you that. You heard about that, yeah. right? Um, and he said after after his last deal, he said, I think it was with Polo Browns. I mean, originally he was TVT, had to buy himself out of that. He, I think he had to pay like 500000 or something. Yeah, yeah. Of his own money yeah. to buy himself out of that. Yeah. Then he signed to Polo Browns. That didn't work out. Had to buy himself out of that for some smaller amount. I think he said like twenty, thirty thousand or something. Mm-hmm. And after that, he said he's never gonna sign another artist deal ever again. Yeah. And it was just because he just kind of clicked with L.A. Reid and L.A. seemed to believe in the music. Mm-hmm. That's why he did he, a partnership. He, he, did, he did a partnership over there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Would you ever sign an artist deal with a major? Nah. I mean, just the structure of the majors. They don't respect talent. You know what I'm saying? I don't but major labels don't respect talent. No, nah, definitely not. Explain that. You you at the bottom of the totem pole. Go go tap dance, go rap, go sing, and then we'll talk to your manager or we'll talk to the executives involved in your situation. You know, of course when you blow up, they jump on your dick and act like, you know, they they don't, but it's not respect. You hmm. know what I'm saying? To me, respect comes first. So when I walk in the door, you know what I'm saying, I'm 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 the executive representing the talent. I'm not the talent. I'm the executive representing the talent. So that's a different conversation. Don't play with me. 
You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't, don't talk to me like the talent is disrespectful to me. Don't talk to me about, you know, we can announce it however you want to announce it. You know, we can make a press release. We, you know, I'm not into that. Don't talk to the talent like that. Don't talk to me like that. Don't talk to, you know, about, you know, be the hottest dude on the West and all that old shit. Talk to the talent like that. Don't talk to me like that. That's not executive talk. You know what I'm saying? So to me, it's like, I would never walk into a situation as talent. I'd never sit in another dude's spot and sell a drugs for him. I've never been about that. You know what I'm saying? I, I bleed the block. I sit on the curb in my own sack. You know what I'm saying? And I, that's, that's always been my philosophy. Even if it's more dangerous to be out front than it is to be in the spot. Even if it's more of a risk even if you look like you at a lower point in the game because you ain't sitting in the spot with somebody else, large amount, you sitting on the curb with your seven grams, your half ounce trying to flip that. You know, I, I'll go that route, you know what I mean? Because it's mine and I'm in it for the long haul. That's why it's a marathon, you know what I'm saying? I'm true to the game. Just like you said, we keep rising. We gonna keep flipping our seven till it's a bird, you know what I'm saying? Right. And then once I'm the bird, man, you gotta respect me as that. Once I'm an executive with a popping artist, you know what I'm saying, with a national buzz and a national fan base or international fan base, you gotta respect me like you respect the other executives with, with national artists. I mean, how much have you really built up a roster of artists on, on, on your label? Well, we don't have nobody signed. Okay. But I, we, you know, we working with Kami Supreme, Rand Paul, myself, you know, a few other artists that we, that we, that we you know, developing. Um, but right now, it's, it's about getting this Nipsey Hussle thing where it needs to be. And uh, once we once we fully take this thing to the next level by dropping the official debut album, definitely we're gonna leave the door open. Sure. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna be able to put things on the shelf. I'm gonna feature my team, obviously, on my records. And uh, I'm gonna do my best to get them a platform to, to come take over and do what they gotta do and say what they gotta say. Oh, you hooked up with me, uh, Young and Reckless. Yeah, we recently did an um, endorsement deal, a joint venture with them between Crenshaw, it's the Marathon Clothing, and uh, Young and Records. Okay, why, why Young and uh, Records? Um, you know, I've been cool with, you know, Rob Darity and, and Drama based on the fantasy factor and just being in the game and respecting what we do and vice versa. And then um, they reached out and was just like, you know, let's sit down and talk about ways we can collab. And we sat with them. It just seemed like a, a good partnership. You know, they was open to our ideas. That was like, whatever y'all want to do, we got the resources to do it. Right. We want to help build your brand. We want to affiliate our brand with what you got going on. We want it to be a true collab project. So again, you know, my go-to guy, George Peniche. I don't take no photos. I don't do no design any other place than with him. So, you know, JP came in, designed the collab piece to capture. That was cool with it. He gonna do the photo shoot, you know, for the billboard campaign. It was cool with it. Um, actually, I just came out here today and showed us the sample pieces from the from the collab that we put together. Right. It'll be a skateboard, a hoodie, a sweater, a letterman jacket, beanie, hat, some dope shit, stickers. Letterman jacket. jacket. That's how it's up. Yeah, the crush all um, <laughs> restless, young restless, letterman jacket. Yeah. yeah. And you guys have a pop up store that's opening tomorrow. Well, the pop-up store that we're doing for the Crenshaw mixtape is tomorrow at Vinnie okay. Styles in Brooklyn. The one like the one we did in Atlanta last week and the one we did uh, in LA October eighth. Yeah, we're gonna cover the one tomorrow too. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, so we're gonna be selling the CDs for hundred dollars. We're gonna be selling the merchandise to Crenshaw hoodies and Crenshaw sweaters. So so there's another hundred dollar mixtape? No, it's Crenshaw. It's we the same one. Yeah, it's just in Brooklyn this time. And it was in Atlanta last week. Do do, do, do any of your fans get a little a little upset? that, you know, there's this limited edition joint and now there's there's more copies I of mean, it. I mean, I think the demand was larger than what we expected. Okay. And so the first thousand is still gonna be a part of like a marathon membership for a lifetime that, that's got perks that, you know, we're gonna elaborate on that as we move forward. But I think my fans wanna see me win. And I think the first thousand units are the ones that made history. Not to, not to diminish the other ones, but I think those first thousand units are, you know, a piece of history that's not going to be erased. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And so um, I think that they want me to expand on that. They 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 want to put me on the highest platform. You know what I'm saying? So this is just an example of us keeping our message pure. This is our way. We don't have to go beg nobody for no marketing money. We can we can go get it directly from our people and give it right back. You know what I'm saying? 
And we we actually doing a, a collab with Young Records also for for Sneaker Watch. Okay. You know, uh, we got a T-shirt, a limited edition T-shirt that's coming out around um, the Jordan Oreo vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about to drop. Yeah. So, so I fuck with drama. Yeah, exactly. They're good people over there. Yeah. I think they get it. Yeah, for sure. You know. Um, are you a sneakerhead? Uh, I'm not as heavy into it as a lot of people are. I like Jordan ones. Okay, you wear the Chucks right now. I keep it basic a lot of times, man, with the Chucks, you know. Like how, how often do the Chucks get worn, you know? Twice, once maybe, and then we need a new pair. Oh, so you throw Chucks after two times? Yeah, I, you know, these are so like, like Air Force Ones pretty much. Yeah, you know, once they get like dingy and shit, that's whack to be walking around and like, unless you like one of them hipsters that like dirty Chucks. That ain't, that ain't <laughs> me, I like my shit clean out the box, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, how much checks go for now? Like what? 40, 50, 50 bucks? bucks yeah, 50 40 bucks? 50 bucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, what percentage of the time do you wear chucks as opposed to Jordans? 80, 20. 80 chucks, 20 Jordans. Yeah. Okay. So you really bought your chucks. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what is it about chucks in, in LA that really has made, made them so prominent out there? For me, this is just like a grinding uniform. Like, I might be in some Dickies and Crenshaw shirts and some chucks because I'm, I'm on my chase right now. You know what I'm saying? I like fly shit, but to me, it's not on me, it's in me. So, you know what I mean? I put my shit on and it's in me, it ain't on me. You know what I mean? I don't put on, you can't put on this shit. It's either in you or it ain't, you know what I'm saying? So, sure. for me, it's just, it makes sense. I like how they look, they match. You know, that's fly to me. You know what I mean? That's fly is like some Giuseppe's or some Red Bottom, or whatever else the $1,200, $1,500 kicks is, you know? But, um, and it's LA, like, you know, that's where we grew up on, you know what I'm saying? So. Chucks and bands, some yeah, LA shit. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I just keep it, you know, on, on pride with, with my selections and shit. Now, what's your favorite Jordans? The ones, Jordan ones. The Jordan ones? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, by the way, you know, the, the ones are sort of a mixed bag with people. Some yeah. people love them, some people not really feeling them. Because they're, they're the least, I, I would say. The least gaudy. What, they're, they're, you could say that, you could say the least gaudy. You could also say they're the least kind of distinctive. You know yeah, what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, you look at a pair of, con, you know, like the, the Converse tennis shoes, they, they look kind of similar to the, the yeah. Jordan ones. They're more like traditional, yeah. classic, yeah. It's high tops. That's why I like them. You That's know what I'm saying? That's why, because, you know, Jays get kind of bulky after the ones, and it's like when it's basketball shoes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Damn near, for real. I like them on girls. I like little, when girls be wearing Jays and shit, you know what I'm saying? But as far as like, I don't like big ass bulky shoes, you know what I'm saying? So I like other J's than the ones, but then it's my, if I was to buy a pair of J's, I'd probably get some all white ones or like some black and red ones or something like that. Okay, so you don't fuck, you know, our people are like. The colors and all those shit. Well, people are obsessed with the threes, you know what I mean? Yeah. The fours, all that you know, shit. You know? I miss that wave, man. You miss that you know wave. Yeah, <laughs> You'll yeah. let that wave go. Yeah, yeah. I feel you, man. Anything else you want to add? Um, nah, just, you know, stay tuned, Marathon Continue, look out for Victory Lap. 2014, got videos coming from Crenshaw. We just did a, um, a nationwide, started nationwide Beats by Drake commercial. It's gonna yeah, be- congrats, congrats on that. Yeah, man. Shout out to Karen Civil. Shout out to KC the boss, man. You know, she's a beast, she go hard. But um, yeah, that was like, you know, a big look for me is because the company I was in, Young Jeezy was in it, YG, Serena Williams other prominent sports figures and there wasn't too many rappers outside of like the two I just named outside of myself. So that was a dope look. I got to wear my brand, so I'm in there with my Crenshaw shit on again, the product placement. Dope. And uh, it's also gonna be in Best Buys. They're gonna have like a TV where the product is set up during the holiday season and the commercial gonna be running through all the Best Buys nationwide. So that's just a dope look. We got the book collab with myself with Jonah Berger for Contagious. We're working on that right now. The Young and Records collab for the Marathon Clothing and Young and Records. Um, worldwide tour start January 9th, 2014. Worldwide tour? Yeah. Which countries? United States, Europe, Asia. Um, Asia? Australia, yeah. yeah. How, how do the Asian fans react to Nipsey Hussle? Man, and because cause I'm, I'm a, I've am been to Asia. Like I, you know, my DJ days, I, I've DJed in Japan. Yeah. In Japan. Nobody, uh, nobody speaks English, for, first of all. For sure. You know, you go to certain places, like you go to Amsterdam, everybody speaks English. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. go to Japan, motherfuckers just stare at you. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so what's it like performing to a Japanese crowd that doesn't quite really understand what you're saying? 
it blew my mind because they knew every word. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When I went, they was, I think it's because I'm from LA and they really infatuated with West Coast Street. This culture. is true. This is true. You know, like, I, mean? I, I was told when I went to Japan to play uh, Dog Pound. Or yeah, like, yeah, Dre. Yeah. Somebody here to fuck. Like, yeah, you know, they should, <laughs> like that shit. Like, it's like the 90s still. Like, yeah. As far as like, like, they'll tell me some shit I know about Daz. Like, yeah, you hear Daz unreleased. <laughs> EP from 1998 called so and so. Like what? I I ain't catch that one. You know what I'm saying? But or tell me something I ain't know about Dre or Cube. And I'm a LA dude. You know what I'm saying? But it was dope. Like some of them people had the same tattoos as me. You know, he went to the little boutique store. They were selling Crenshaw merchandise that they had bought from LA. Brought it to Japan and put the crazy markup on it because it was exclusive. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, we was in um, Nagoya. We was in you know. Fukushima, we was in um, Tokyo, you know, and all the shows sold out. We did crazy um, meet and greets afterwards for hours with signing shit and selling out of all of our merch. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was just dope, you know, so I'm excited to see what it's like now, especially being the title of my project is Crenshaw. I know how it's gonna hit out there. I know how they view Crenshaw. You know what I mean? That's probably where it's gonna be the biggest, actually. They got, yeah, they got lowrider clubs out there. That's like something real right. to them. You know what I mean? And so um, I'm excited about Asia, Europe. I, I love going to Europe. We got London. We doing a pop up shop in London. With DJ Semtex. Semtex, in a, yeah. Yeah, in a, in a streetwear line called um, Trap Star. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to do a pop up shop out there with the $100 CD in London. Um, going to Paris, going to um, all through France, Copenhagen, Germany, Australia, Sydney. It's all around. Every major market in the United States. You know, and then we're gonna get back home and finish the album and start promoting. Dope. Yeah. That's all we need, man. For sure. We good. Glad. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, homie.